the Lord. We're looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this morning. We're going to be taking several weeks looking at this chapter, and uh, we're, we're really just in the, the introduction as he emphasizes the prominence of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm just going to read the first three verses this morning. This is a well-known chapter by many people, known as the, the love chapter. Now, the Bible uses here the word charity. It's the same word as in John 3, 16. God so loved the world. And I was thinking this week, you know, when a word is important, Satan likes to distort it. And he's made charity when you, you give things away that you don't really want. <laughs> you know? Well, that's not charity. In the Bible, charity is the love of God. It's God sending his son. It's giving your very best at your cost, at your expense. And uh, that's the kind of love we're looking at this morning. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. We'll just stop reading there. It was written specifically to the, the church at, at Corinth there, and we saw last week that this was a church that had lots of activity. They had lots of spirituality. Uh, in, in chapter 1, he'd said to them, uh, in everything you're enriched by him. Uh, he said, uh, you come behind no gift. Uh, they had plenty of gifts, plenty of activity going on, but they evidently lacked love. And the reason I say that is because of the, the confusion and disunity that you see him dealing with uh, in their church. In uh, chapter 1, he, he said to them, there are, are contentions among you. In chapter 3, he said to them, I couldn't speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. For ye are yet carnal, and he, he, here he gives the reason, this is chapter 3, verse 3, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? They didn't have the love of the Lord being evident in their relationships with each other. They didn't have the unity that, that should be there. You know, it's not as important that we agree on everything as it is that we love. Now, unity is important, and, and agreeing on things is good. Uh, but love comes from submission to God and His Word. Love is not a feeling. You know, the world kind of promotes love as, as something that, that comes, comes and goes, and you know, people talk about, you know, I woke up and I, I didn't love him anymore. <laughs> well, if that was true, you never loved him in the first place. Um, it, you know, it's not a feeling. It, it's a commitment. It's a sacrifice. And we see it in the love of God. You, you know, I was thinking as we sang that song this morning, change my heart, O God. Let me be like you. Let me warn you. There should come a warning on that. It's going to cost you to love like God. God gave his son. God gave his best. God sacrificed. God left heaven. Man, we won't even hardly leave our bed. <laughs> God left heaven to live as a man and to, to die for us. Uh, that's the kind of love we're, we're talking about this morning. It's not at all, uh, well, God gives us feelings. Feelings can be good or bad, but uh, love is not based on a feeling. Love is, is based on the source. And the Bible says the source of love is, is God himself. God is love. In, uh, in 1 John, he says, this, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. You know, we might think that's backwards. You know, we, we know that we, we love God when we keep his commandments. No, he says, you'll know that you're loving the children of God when you love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Love involves Believing and obeying God's word. Let, let me give you just a, a, a couple of points here from Philippians chapter 2 uh, before we get right into the verses there in, in Corinthians. Philippians chapter 2 gives us the fourfold basis of unity. I just want to give this to you briefly and you can think about it more in your own time. But Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. I could put this up on the screen, but... He says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, 
if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He gives you the fourfold basis there for unity as, as Christians. Number one, consolation in Christ. Listen, if you've come to Christ for consolation, so has every other Christian. We have the same consolation in Christ. We're, if we're all tuned into him, we're all going to be tuned into each other. The reason we have trouble is because we're not tuned into Christ. Consola there is consolation in Christ. Secondly, he, has, he says, there is the comfort of love. The same comfort that God offers you, he offers to everyone. Uh, the divine love that, uh, that God produces in us causes and enables us to love each other. That, that's the subject that we're looking at in 1 Corinthians 13. The, the third one he mentions there is, if any fellowship in the Spirit, fellowship of the Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that every Christian has is the Holy Spirit you have. Now, sometimes I go door knocking, just get out to you know, annoy people. No, not really. But some people are really happy to see you. Oh, that's great. You know, we go to such and such a church, and we're glad to see you out doing that. There's other people who say, oh, we have our own church. My common question is, if they let me, is, oh, is it a Christian church? And usually, say, yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. And I'm just trying to get them to see, if you're a Christian and, and I'm a Christian, it, it shouldn't be this, <laughs> you know? I'm not here to harass you. I'm, you know, I'm here with, because of the love of God. And it's interesting to see the different, uh, the different reactions. My conclusion, uh, fortunately, I'm not God, <laughs> uh, is that they're probably not a Christian, but they just have a church that they may or may not attend. I've had people say, now, hon, what's that church we go to? <laughs> you know, uh, a commitment to the Lord changes your life. And it's the same consolation, it's the same love, it's the same Holy Spirit for each Christian. And that leads to the fourth one, if any bowels and mercies. Now we wouldn't use that expression nowadays, we'd talk about being tenderhearted. But that's what he's talking about. Uh, the product of what we get from the Lord is a tender heart and compassion. The opposite is a hard heart. He talks there in, in verse 2 about having, having the same love. Love comes from God. And this thing of love is, is so important. The more I've studied this, the, the, the more I, I see, we many times just gloss over this thing of love. We kind of take it or leave it. God says it's, it's very, very important. And that's what he's showing us there in, in 1 Corinthians 13, especially in those first three verses. Later, later on, we'll be looking at the characteristics and qualities of love. But in the first three verses, he shows us that if we don't have love, hey, we don't have anything. Really. We need to understand the prominence of love. There's some amazing statements in the Bible about love. Love is of God. God is love. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, the prominence of love. Last week we looked at languages without love are nothing. Um, communication is very important. But basically what he's saying here is you could be the best speaker in the world... And if you don't have love, it's just noise. Now, in the adult Bible class this morning, they just happened to hit a verse. It made me think. Um, Jesus was talking to some people, and God spoke from heaven. And the people said, people that stood by heard it and said, it thundered. Others said, it's an angel spake to him. It made me wonder if... if what he's referring to there is the idea that maybe, you know, it'd be like if an angel spoke and it sounded like thunder, you know, if you could speak like that, you know, when you spoke. He said, without love, it's just noise. It's just noise. Well, then he goes on in, in verse 2, though I have the gift of prophecy, prophecy without love is nothing. You know, God has spoken through various men in different ages. That's what he talks about in Hebrews. God has spoken in times past through the prophets and so on. Uh, so the word prophecy means forth to speak. It doesn't always refer to telling the future. Now, sometimes it does. Sometimes God is, is giving uh, a person what's going to happen in the future. But basically, God just gives them the truth, and they write it down. And we, we have it recorded as, as Scripture. A prophecy. If God used you to write the Bible, and you didn't have love, 
He said, well, what's, what's the, the expression? He says, doesn't make you anything. He says, I am nothing. There, there's an example of that in the Old Testament with a man named Balaam. Balaam was used to record a prophecy of the Messiah. I mean, God used him. His words are recorded in Scripture. Um, and yet, he also helped the enemy to know how to uh, defeat God's people by encouraging them to sin. You know, he didn't have the love of God. And several times in the New Testament, we read about Balaam. The sin of Balaam was that he loved money <laughs> more than God. You see, prophecy without love is nothing. A good example of this is Jeremiah. You know, God called Jeremiah uh, to, to preach the gospel from, from birth. And uh, he, he said to him as, as an adult in, in Jeremiah chapter 1, just read you this. It says, uh, but first he told him, be not afraid of their faces. You know, that's the encouragement every prophet needs, every speaker needs. Don't be afraid of their faces. It says, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and said unto me, behold, I've put my words in thy mouth. God was going to use Jeremiah to be a prophet. Later on, you see his heart when he says, and I find this... Uh, Honestly, it's hard to read. He says, the harvest is past. The summer is ended. We are not saved. We are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I'm black. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Oh, that my head were waters. Do you see his heart? He said, God, summer has come and gone, and we're not healed. He doesn't say, they're not healed, you dirty, rotten people, you're not healed. He says, we're not healed. He had a heart for his people. You see, prophecy without love is nothing. I believe Jeremiah had both. A preacher's two great enemies, number one is departing from the truth. Number two is not caring about the people. And either one of those will ruin your ministry. It'll ruin your home. Depart from the truth, depart from love, it'll ruin your home. It'll ruin your work. I mean, it's just a standard. How about you? What about your words? It's not enough just to have words. Even if you had the words from God without love, it says it's nothing. He tells us in Ephesians to speak the truth in love. We need to speak the truth. There's people who need you to love them so much that you'll tell them the truth but do it in love. See, the power of our message, the power of the message is the motive. Really. And the love of God, there's no greater motivation than that. Then he goes on, not only uh, languages without love are nothing, prophecy without love is nothing. He, the third one he talks about there is knowledge without love. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge... Now, in the Bible, a mystery is something that was hidden in the past and now has been revealed. You know, there's things that in the Old Testament, they didn't really know. They had no idea that Jew and Gentile would be one in Christ. That was a mystery, revealed in Christ. But what he's saying here is, if you knew every mystery, every secret in the mind of God, if you knew every fact, you meet people like that who think they know every fact, you know. If you knew every fact in the world, but without love, he says, you're nothing. It's important to know what we believe. It's important to have facts. But we also need to have love. In Philippians chapter 1 and, and verse 9, he says, This I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. There's a lot of people who have misunderstandings about love. They don't even really know what love is. We need not only to love, but we need to love in knowledge and understanding. God teaching us and helping us. Knowledge without love is nothing. Then he says, faith without love is nothing. Though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. Now, how often do you need to move a mountain? You know, Jesus talked about it. You know, if you had all faith, you could pray to this mountain and it would move. You know, I mean, really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an expression to help us see we need to have faith, but we need to have love. He said, if you had so much faith, you could move a mountain and you didn't have love, it's nothing. 
You know, the world might applaud, but God wouldn't. Faith without love is, is nothing. If you could have complete faith. Now, I don't think you could actually have complete faith without having love. I think it's part of it. But, so he's just, the, the illustration he's making here is, is that without love, even faith is nothing. And then he goes on in, in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Benevolence. Aren't you glad for benevolence? You know, we live in a country where there's, there's good things that, that are done. You know, I, mean, I talk to people and I visit people all the time who are, who are being helped by one organization or another, uh, people who are doing things that, that help people. Um, the phrase he's using here is, is not talking about an impersonal thing. It's talking about giving it yourself one bit at a time. You know, if you're giving of yourself, you're doing it regularly, um, he said, you can sacrifice without love. You know, if you were to, to be benevolent and sacrificial without love, sometimes we do it uh, under maybe a sense of obligation. Oh, I better do this. Uh, I haven't been very good lately. I, I, better, I better go to church and, you know, so that God will love me. Or, uh, you know, I better, I better give in the offering. I, I need the Lord's favor. Uh, we need to be careful of our motivation. Uh, we need to give uh, because we love. But the point he's making here is you can give... Everything you have, without love, it's nothing. And then he, he really gets down to the nitty-gritty. Though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Wow. You know, there have been people who've, who've died for the Lord. And he, the, he's saying here, if you died serving the Lord and you weren't serving the Lord because of love, What's the word he uses? It profits me nothing. You know, there's people who do this for all kinds of reasons. There's people who burn themselves and kill themselves. In World War II, there were the kamikaze pilots, you know, that would kill themselves to sink a, a ship and, and so on. Uh, there's literally, there's been missionaries who've been killed and eaten by the people they were trying to reach. Uh, you know, we, people almost make a joke of that, but you know, it's very seriously. They, they called Africa the missionary's graveyard. Because so many people went trying to share the gospel and were killed. Uh, but what he's saying is, you could do such a sacrificial thing as that, and if you don't do it because of the love of God, he said, it's, it profits nothing. And the key, I think, to this, this point is the end of each verse. The end of verse 1, he says, a loveless person just produces noise, nothing of value. Just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. The end of verse 2, uh, he says, a loveless person themselves is of no value. And I thought, this, this is probably the hardest one for, for us to swallow. So that I, even though I do all these things and have not charity, I am nothing. We don't like to think of ourselves as nothing. But without love, our, our life is just a zero. And then he says in verse 3, if I do all these things and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Uh, a loveless person receives nothing of value. Uh, listen to me very, very closely now. What God is saying here is you can spend a whole life and have absolutely no positive result if it's not lived with love. You know, we sing, change my heart, O God. Let me be like you. That's exactly what, what we need. Uh, there, there are those who live a whole life, and their whole life is wasted. Love is what gives value and meaning to life. What I'm begging you this morning is, don't waste your life. You know, two of the, to me, two of the biggest enemies to this are selfishness and hard-heartedness. One of the main reasons we don't love others is because we love ourselves too much. You know, there's people who keep saying, oh, I need to learn to love myself. Listen, God calls that a lie. He says, no man ever yet hated himself. You need to believe God on this. The problem is not loving yourself. It's to quit loving yourself so much and love God and love others because of your love for God. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God didn't, say, he didn't sit up in heaven and say, oh, they're saying mean things about me. They're, they should obey me. No. God said, how can I love them? How can I meet their need? How can I solve this problem that they have? I'll go. I'll be a man. 
I'll die for their sins. I'll be the sacrifice. See, that's the love of God. Hard-heartedness as well. As a pastor, you, you hear out lots of things, and I tell you, one of the things you hear is selfishness and hard-heartedness. Two, that's two things. Uh, you know, when someone wrongs you, you are confronted with a choice. You can be hard-hearted and selfish, or you can be like Jesus. Those are hard words, aren't they? I mean, really. And pe people are going to wrong us. You're going to wrong people. And, and when you wrong people, just hope that it's a person who will respond like Jesus and will help you. Because sometimes you'll wrong people and you won't even know it. Listen, don't give in to selfishness and hard-heartedness. I've, I've met people who 50 years ago someone wronged them. and Man, they can play that record like it's, it's their favorite. They can lay everything out as to what happened and why and what was said and who did it. It's like bringing out their favorite pet and you know, just having a real good time with that bitterness and anger that they've, they've kept in their heart. Sometimes for, for so many years that the people are even dead who wronged them. Folks, that, that's a wasted life. Now, I don't know your heart, but God does. And if God is bringing someone or something to mind here, listen, today is the day to forgive. Today is the day to see, well, Lord, what good thing did you have in mind through that that went on in my life? Because the Bible says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Listen, God, God could take death and make it the remedy for our sin. God can take your situation and he can make it, make you more like Jesus. The love of God. Don't waste your life. Let me give you some verses here from, from 1 John. Uh, he, he's got some just amazing things that he says. You probably know 1 John 4, 7, and 8. We sing it. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Here's a hard verse. Listen to verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. The next verse tells us, love has come to us. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. God made real. He made something that we can grab onto in sending his son, Jesus Christ. His love was manifest. And then he says, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means covering. Jesus' blood became the covering for our sins. So that when God looks at our sins, he sees the blood of Christ. What a blessing. Love is costly. But let me tell you, it's worth the investment. It was worth it to God to be our Savior. And it'll be worth it to you in the situations of your life to choose to love. Now, it's got to start with loving God. It needs to start with you saying, Lord, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe the gospel. I realize I'm a sinner. Lord, save me. You need to respond by faith to the love of God. And then the Bible says God will help you then to, to love others. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Respond to God's love. Uh, the right response to God's love is love and faith. One more verse, and then I'll quit. 1 John 3, 23. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. Two things he says in that verse. We need to believe, and we need to love. Those are the two basic issues of life. You need to believe God's word. You need to believe God when he said what he said. When he's done, what he's done. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and the second one, and love one another as he gave his commandment. Uh, life is not easy. Life can be very hard. Some of you have it harder than others, but it, you, you need to believe the Lord. He's the author of life. He's the author of love. And he can help you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's, that's the relationship he wants, is for him to be your guide, for him to be your hope, for him to be your comfort, your peace. He's available. 
Uh, he says it's, it's freely available and he's got more than you need. <laughs> uh, this morning, maybe you need to trust the Lord. Maybe you need to be saved, become a Christian. Maybe you're a Christian, you need to apply your Christianity to your situation of life. God can help you. Uh, let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, Lord, there's things we don't understand, but Father, this was pretty simple this morning. Thank you. Thank you that you love us, that you were willing to die for our sins. And Lord, I pray if there are those here this morning that don't know you, your Holy Spirit could help them to see the simplicity of salvation. Thank you, Father, that uh, you paid the price and can offer it to us freely. I pray these things in Jesus' name. We're going to 